now it's time for us to discuss more of these headlines and simple keywords with Adam joining us via Zoom. Good morning, Adam. Good morning, Lena. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Have you had one of those mornings where you can't enunciate? I... Well, yeah. four out of the five days of the week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if we get one nice day, we call it a yeah. winner. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. right there and it's frustrating and it's making it worse. Yeah. Eventually, I mean, I'll this wake time up. of morning, it happens to all the best of us. I mean, yeah, totally hey. understandable. I go through it pretty much on a daily basis. Great so. company. It's making you feel better. I think I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'll power through it. <laughs> all right. Uh, let's get started with keyword news. As always, we have many headlines to cover, starting with North Korea's 10th trash balloon campaign in two months. This is our first keyword of the day. Trash balloons. So North Korea has again launched hundreds of trash-filled balloons towards South Korea, with some of them even landing on the presidential compound, although it's been confirmed nothing dangerous was found. Now, this is a 10th launch just this year, so it's much more frequent. What's the latest? Yeah, much more frequent. And there's, uh, of course, hundreds of them being launched as well. So thousands in total when uh, when uh, they're all added up. Now, the Joint Chiefs of Staff said it detected around 300 balloons, but said there actually could be uh, more, uh, some 250 balloons have actually fallen, mostly in Seoul in the northern area of nearby Kyungi province. Now, when it fell on the presidential compound, a chemical, biological and radiological warfare response team was sent to collect the balloons, uh, but they were found to pose no uh, risk uh, to safety and no contamination. Uh, the military didn't actually shoot down the balloons as they feared it could cause their contents to spread uh, even further. Uh, the balloons also landed in other parts of Seoul as well. Officials are telling residents, as usual, to avoid touching the balloons and to report them to the nearest military unit or police station. Uh, the latest incident comes after South Korea's military expanded its loudspeaker broadcasts along the border, uh, pretty much uh, to full expansion at the moment. Uh, Defense Minister Shin Wasik warns that North Korea actually also might retaliate uh, by shooting or shelling areas where South Korean civilian groups launch uh, anti-North Korea leaflets. Uh, some civic groups, meanwhile, are calling on the government to stop the broadcast as they could provoke further military actions from North Korea, especially civic groups living uh, or residing in uh, areas like Paju, which is near mm. uh, the border to North Korea and uh, could, of course, fall victim to some military provocation if uh, Pyongyang does decide to do so. Uh, to South Korea's round-the-clock loudspeaker campaign, it seems the North has also put up its own speakers. I mean, its capacity and just technological advantage it falls thin compared to what South Korea offers. So apparently the range is about three kilometers, so it doesn't really reach South Korea, namely, for example, Paju. But yeah. it does, I think, muffle the sound coming from the South. Maybe that's what they were aiming to do, at least according to yeah, experts say Yeah, experts say that's basically the main goal of those, to try and distort uh, the broadcasts that are coming in from South Korea uh, mm. rather than try to blast them at South Korea directly. So, yeah, these uh, South Korea loudspeaker broadcasts, they are kind of meant to... Uh, the psychological warfare tactics, mm. basically, try to kind of... Um, uh, influence uh, the north of the people in the, uh, and the military in the North Korea border. Uh, but uh, yeah, it is mainly aimed at trying to uh, muffle the sound and uh, disrupt it, basically. All right. All of this does add up to higher tensions at the border. We'll try to understand the implications uh, with an expert in our second hour, too. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, our second keyword of the day. Yoon Mi Tan. So President Yoon has hosted a dinner for the new leadership of the People Power Party, the returning Han dong at the presidential office. What came out of this meeting? Right. So this was the first official meal between Yoon and Han in nearly six uh, months. Uh, Han, Han had previously declined a meal invitation from Yoon in mid-April, actually, what he cited uh, due to health reasons after uh, the general election. Now, during the dinner, Yoon emphasized unity and moving forward. He also encouraged the new leadership to think of themselves as comrades and uh, maintain direct communication with the presidential office. And he urged Han to demonstrate strong leadership and effectively guide the party. Uh, Han responded by expressing his commitment to the success of the Yoon administration uh, and the goal of winning the next election. Now, there is a regional election happening uh, in two years' time, in fact. Now, floor leader Chu Kyung-ho called for unity against bills being pushed by the Democratic Party. 
Japan's rivals in the leadership race also attended and stressed party unity um, as well. Now, the dinner included key figures from the PPP and the presidential office, fostering an atmosphere of uh, unity and cooperation. Uh, Yoon and Han even shared uh, a so-called love shot toast, uh, which was seen as a gesture to dispel rumours of any conflict between them. Now, the dinner lasted about two hours and was described as a warm and friendly gathering. Attendees noted that there was no discussion on current political issues. The main topic and agenda was basically to show that the ruling party is unified and will be going forward. Mm. Uh, Han, as well, did not have a private meeting with you during the event, uh, counter to what uh, some people were expecting. All right. Uh, does it actually quell rumors about the Yun Han conflict being in trouble? Does it put it to rest? We'll wait and see. Let's move on to our third keyword of the day. E-commerce crisis. So delayed refunds and payments by Korean affiliates of Singapore-based e-commerce platform Q10 are causing market chaos. What's the latest? Yeah, especially for the likes of T-Mod and WeMake Price, the two big e-commerce uh, platforms here in Korea. Uh, they're reportedly unable to process refunds for customers uh, and new transactions have been halted, effectively crippling their operations. Now, this situation arose after numerous sellers reported delayed payments to them. Uh, which we reported on yesterday. Now, major payment service providers handling transactions for Team Honor We Make Price have imposed limits on cancellations and stopped new transactions. These providers manage card transactions and uh, bank transfers. Other payment methods like Kakao Pay have also followed suit as well. Now, the newly imposed cancellation limit means that if the amount of cancelled transactions exceeds the amount of new sales, refunds cannot basically be processed. Uh, this is common for small businesses, but it's unusual for large companies like Timon and We Make Price. Now, consumers attempting to cancel orders on both platforms are encountering failures, leaving them unable to retrieve their money. Uh, Timon and We Make Price have suggested bank transfers as an alternative refund method, but this process is slow and dependent on customer service responses, making it somewhat unreliable uh, and of course consumers are not happy some of them have actually gathered at the headquarters of we make price to demand refunds for purchased uh, travel products and other items as well now with both platforms unable to process new transactions their ability to generate revenue and resolve settlement delays is severely hampered uh, this situation puts them of course at risk of closure uh, their parent company, Q10, is also struggling with financial issues as well, making it unlikely that they can support these uh, platforms effectively. Now, the issue apparently stems from a liquidity crisis at Q10 after the takeover of another shopping platform in spring uh, did not leave enough money for basically transactions. Apparently, Q10 used money uh, from the coffers of Timon and We Make Price to make that deal. So, yeah, of course, it leaves those both uh, those two platforms uh, in a bit of trouble. Now, an official at the presidential office said the government will do its best to minimize the damage to customers uh, and sellers. So, yeah, if you are basically looking to buy products on uh, mm. Team on and we make price do so at your own risk. Uh, it is a bit of a, a shaky situation at the moment. And so if you do buy it and get it and you're happy with the product, uh, then it's not really a problem. But if you want to get a refund, then at the moment, it seems like you can't really get one. Mm. It seems sellers are reluctant to put up their own products too at this point in time. Right. Ricky Waters. All right. Yeah, there's a lot that are uh, withdrawing from both platforms en masse, basically. So, yeah, it is certainly in the doldrums at the moment. All right, let's move on to our fourth keyword of the day. K-Beauty. So the government is partnering with the cosmetics industry and the giants to support and grow small and medium-sized Korean beauty companies and to further boost Korean beauty products. Tell us the details. Yeah, so of course, K-Beauty or Korean cosmetics is a huge export item, especially and it's also the top export item among SMEs in Korea as well. There's a lot of demand for it, especially in markets like China and Japan and uh, spreading across uh, to Europe as well. Now, the government announced a plan to enhance the global competitiveness of K-Beauty SMEs and uh, signed a cooperation agreement at the CJ Olive Young headquarters in Yongsan. Of course, uh, Olive Young being a huge retailer of such cosmetics. Now, the government aims to improve the global competitiveness of cosmetic SMEs through 
uh, working with private companies to find and help potential export companies, uh, systematically addressing and managing export regulations in various countries, and improving the overall environment to support the growth and competitiveness of cosmetics SMEs. Now, the goal is to increase the export value of SME cosmetics from last year's 5.3 billion won to 10, uh, sorry, dollars to 10 billion dollars by the year 2027. The, the government also wants to grow the number of exporting SMEs themselves from 8,360 uh, 8, to 10,000 by the same year. Uh, they plan to do this by utilizing the expertise and infrastructure by com of companies like CJ Olive Young, Amazon, Cosmax, and Colmar, mm. uh, big heavyweights in the industry to nurture promising K beauty companies. A fund will also be set up for big players to invest in cosmetics manufacturing companies as well. The government will also update and distribute manuals on export regulations for major and emerging markets. Of course, if you want to uh, go overseas, you need to know the markets that you're going into. And the government is basically saying it'll help these companies out with that. Mm. Uh, there'll also be increased funding, smart factory initiatives and R&D to facilitate the rapid development and production of innovative products as well. Mm, I mean, when it comes to exporting uh, beauty products, I mean, there are all kinds of legal hurdles and not just regulations, but the standards are different in each country. For example, if I try to buy certain cosmetics from the United States, there are all these restrictions like the Korean government has. So not everything is yeah. fair game. So a lot of these gaps need to be filled, especially for small companies that might not have the same resources as the aforementioned giants. We'll see, uh, giving the K-beauty yeah. industry more boost. Yeah, and on that, uh, actually, uh, relevant government ministries are actually meeting and working together to try and uh, set some guidelines uh, for that to try to help these companies understand what regulations are in place as well. Because, of course, it is uh, chemical products that exactly. are being sold. So, of course, there are some safety standards to be met. I don't think they should market it with that. Chemical products right. for your face. <laughs> I know that's uh, probably uh, not the best of terms that companies will be happy with me using, but uh, essentially it is what it is. But uh, yeah, basically safety methods uh, right. and uh, standards do need to be followed. Yeah. All right, let's move on to our final keyword of the day. Record births. So a number of birds went up for the second straight month in May with the number of marriages on an upward trend. This marks the first time in about eight years and a half uh, that the birth rate has risen for two consecutive months. But as you can imagine, is it a one time peak or is this a really changing trend? That's a big question. Tell us more. Right. So data from Statistics Korea shows that there were 19,547 births. Uh, that's a 27 percent increase compared to the same month last year. The last time the number of births increased for two months in a row was actually in October and November, all the way back in 2015. Uh, the agency mainly attributed the rise to a base effect from low birth rates the previous year. It also cited an upward trend in the number of marriages from August 2022 to the first half of 2023. This is due mainly to delayed uh, marriages from the pandemic happening in that period as well as government incentives for childbirths and marriages uh, and other uh, support measures as well. Uh, but uh, the number of births uh, themselves remains relatively low. It's the second lowest figure on record after dropping to the lowest ever for the month of May last year. Uh, from January to May this year as well, the cumulative number of births was 99,070, falling below 100,000 and setting a new record low as, uh, again. Uh, the agency said that while further obs observations are needed, as of now, it expects the nation to continue seeing increases in the number of births and marriages in the latter half of the year. Whether that trend will continue, of course, remains to be seen. Is this just an after effect of uh, things picking up again after the pandemic? Of course, a lot of marriages suffered. Uh, there weren't that many during the pandemic. And of course, they are happening afterwards. We're only about uh, a year uh, after the the peak of the the pandemic, basically. So, mm. yeah, all these kind of positive data could probably be going to be uh, streaming in now, but uh, how long it will last is another question. We'll wait and see. Thank you very much, Adam, for today's coverage. We'll speak to you again tomorrow. You're very welcome. See you tomorrow. If you're listening to our program using the podcast service, just a reminder that we do go live Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. Korea Standard Time. So tune in and help us make the show more informative by giving us your input. See you bright and early on Good Morning Seoul.